YouTube, good morning and welcome back to the channel, CrayCloud IT Pro. In this video, I'm going to talk about the cybersecurity kill chain and how that methodology can be integrated within Microsoft Sentinel to help you improve your security coverage within your organization. Grab your coffee, grab your whiskey, because this one's going to get pretty damn juicy. If you can, please drop a comment and a like down below. It helps support the channel and don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Have a great day. Stay frosty. In this video, I'm going to talk about the cybersecurity kill chain and how that methodology can be integrated into Microsoft Sentinel to help you improve your security co coverage within your organization. Cybersecurity isn't something new. It's been around since the dawn of computing, since the days when you could hack bulletin boards or a dial up modem. But now since cloud computing has expanded and grown such significantly and rapidly, that more and more companies are realizing that their internal security isn't really up to practice. And they do tend to feel embarrassed by the lack of controls that are in place with no documentation. So when cybersecurity professionals want to make sure they have the right defenses in place to prevent a cyber attack, they often refer to the cybersecurity kill chain model. So this concept walks organizations through the typical phases of an attack highlights areas where they may need to shore up their defenses or prioritize resources to minimize business impact in case of an incident or breach. Security leaders may also find that the kill chain model is a useful tool for explaining cybersecurity measures to business executives so they can then secure adequate funding for their cybersecurity programs. With that in mind, here's how the cybersecurity module can work very well and integrated with Microsoft Sentinel to give you that bit more coverage from a detection perspective. So what is the cyber kill chain? So the cyber kill chain model is based on the military concept of a kill chain, which describes the phase of an attack for the purpose of creating proactive defense strategies to prevent it, particularly at the earliest phases when the least damage is done. According to the Sands Institute, a security defense contractor, Lockheed Martin, originally created this cyber kill chain in 2011 in a white paper that outlines the key phases of a cyber attack. <coughs> security professionals use this methodology to make sure that they are considering the entire life cycle of a cyber attack, that they are fully aware of the vulnerabilities that could be exploited in such attack, and that they have sufficient controls in place to ward it off. Evaluating the kill chain is one strategy for increasing cybersecurity resilience and helping prevent a damaging data breach. Today, there are multiple cyber kill chain models, such as the MITRE attack and the unified kill chain. Many of these models, including the original, have been updated to include insider threats, social engineering, exploits such as phishing. While there are plenty of variations on the Lockheed model, it remains the version that is the most commonly referenced from a cyber perspective. So the seven phase approach includes reconnaissance, weaponization, delivery, exploitation, installation, command and control, and that should say data exfiltration, but it says actions and objectives, but it's exfiltration. So let's pretend that that says exfiltration and move on. So first we have reconnaissance. So passive reconnaissance would be finding out your company name and what you do. So there's no way to prevent this. If you're on LinkedIn or any social media saying where you work, people can easily do passive reconnaissance and you wouldn't even know. Active reconnaissance is actually finding out potential information of the victim. So maybe assuming an email address with the potential to send phishing emails using the victim's first dot last name at company.com. This email format is completely standard across the board for most companies. Or it could be port numeration, you know, running active scans on a system or a public application to find out what ports are open that could have been exploited. Azure Firewall is a native firewall service in Azure, which can easily collect logs when a source IP connects to a destination port or an uncommon port for the organization. So these are two analytics to help kind of capture that reconnaissance. Then you have storage account enumeration. So like finding available blob storage that are publicly accessible. 
enumerating the obvious syntax of blob.core naming service, then once they have gained access or found relevant account information, this may contain like ARM template deployment files, which will give you information on how their cloud infrastructure has been configured or deployed. I actually cover this in a deep dive video on the dangers of public storage account. I'll just pop it in the top right here for you. Along with analytic detections. So, you know, give that video a watch. It's pretty good. It's mine. <laughs> so then from reconnaissance, the adversary has now found a way into the system, maybe for a port being open or a Zorda exploit uh, or unpatched servers. This really comes when the weaponization comes in. So this is one of the steps which is probably the most uncaptured from a scene perspective because this is where the adversary starts building the malware or exploit to engage your systems. So you won't actually know what the weapon is going to be. Maybe you have an application that has some missing core rule sets that are not OWASP compliant and the adversary can then run uh, and manipulate or create malware to create a SQL injection or cross-site scripting attack. It could be delivered by a phishing email. It might be a compromised website. Weaponization is going to be the point of entry for an attack whilst they're building the ultimate program to exploit your system. So a quick detection rule to help with uh, an assumed weaponized attack would be new processes observed in the last 24 hours. So these new processes could be benign new programs installed on hosts. However, especially in normal stable environments, these new processes provide an indication of an unauthorized malicious binary that has been installed and run successfully. Reviewing the wider context of the logon sessions in these binaries can provide a good starting point for actually identifying the possibility that you've had a breach and you're under attack. Delivery is then followed very closely by weaponization. And this is how the adversary has approached how they're going to deliver a payload. This may be in the form of a phishing email or a compromised account due to a successful brute force. Maybe it's going old school and using a malicious USB. Phishing is still the number one attack that adversaries use, and they're still succeeding with it today. Unfortunately, it happens a lot more than you think because these sophisticated emails that are coming through, they appear very legitimate. So to capture this method, first, you're going to want to enable Defender for Office 365. Now, a lot of companies do have Office 365, and you'd like to think that, you know, you would have some sort of, uh, you know, security product behind that. So once you've had that and you've integrated that within Sentinel, this will then allow you for the detection, following detection alerts to be enabled. And these are a potentially malicious URL was detected. Email messages containing malware were removed after delivery. Email messages containing phishing URLs were removed after delivery. Email reported by user as a malware or phishing. And suspicious email sending passions were detected. Next one to exploitation. This is when an adversary has now gained access and has executed a piece of malware. So this can be done through an application, a SQL attack, phishing email, a user opens up a friendly Word document, or they've got through the system of a port or a compromised account due to bad credentials. So adversaries will frequently utilize system utilities in their operations to bypass and avoid name-based detections. So these utilities could be rundll32.exe, uh, CMD, PowerShell, uh, Cert Utility, etc. So, for example, like a threat actor's Operation Soft Cell, they changed the name of CMD.exe to CDM. Now, that simple character change is so minor that if you haven't got any detection set up, this may go completely unnoticed. So, this query on screen is detecting a suspicious parent of csc.exe which could be a sign of a payload delivery and then if you look at the system.management.automation utils and the ma amsi which stands for anti-malware scan interface this is like baked into windows and is designed to allow for the most common malware scanning and protection techniques 
It supports a calling structure allowing for file and memory scanning as well as stream scanning. So if you have a bunch of code which is like obfuscated, it makes it very difficult for antivirus to actually pick that up as malicious code. So the query on screen, be it very basic, is looking at the process 4688 and it's using where the command line contains dash NOP, which stands for no profile, and the command line contains dash ENC, which stands for encoded. So any process that X is executing something with those switches are sometimes abnormal because a lot of programs do not execute with an encoded switch. We're now on to installation. So the adversary downloads and installs more malicious software on the target system to maintain access to the network for an extended period of time. The adversaries may use the weapon to install a backdoor to uh, gain remote access. But after the injection of the code on a target system, the adversary has now gained the capability to spread the infection to the other systems within the network. Also, this kind of hides the presence of a malicious activity from security controls like firewalls because they can hide their techniques using encryption. So a great example of a query to use in Sentinel would be rare order activity initiated by a user. So this compares the current day to the last 14 days of audits to identify new audit activities initiated by a user. So this query can be extremely helpful when attempting to track down malicious activity related to additions of new users, new groups, removal from groups, or specific users. The next banger is anomalous RDP activity. So adversaries may use valid accounts to log on to a computer using remote desktop protocol. The adversary then may, use act, may perform actions inside of that machine when they're logged on. So Fin10, for example, has used RDP to laterally move uh, between systems within a victim environment. And then another fan favorite of mine is multiple RDP hops. So this is another great detection where a user or users are accessing multiple RDP sessions at the same time. And this analytic can be tuned to a bare minimum of like one or two, but any more than five, you've got to start questioning why the hell are so many people logging on to multiple RDP sessions? You shouldn't be RDPing to servers anyway, especially like, like the main controllers. This is another exclusion that you could put in and maybe implement that into a watch list. So once any of these analytics trigger, then that's going to give you uh, an indication that, hey, someone's doing something, they're installing something on a network. Then this phase, command and control, or C2 as it's called, so adversaries will typically achieve a C2 via a beacon over an external network path. So beacons are usually HTTP or HTTPS based and appear as like ordinary traffic due to falsified HTTP headers. So detecting for files that are transmitting over obscure ports from a not known IP address is where Sentinel can actually help you. So creating a detection rule for a list of known files and known IP addresses and having that rule specify if any file is transmitting data that isn't in my known list, you know, go and alert me. Um, a great couple of detections are malicious connections to LDAP port for log4j vulnerability. So this query looks for connections to the default LDAP ports to find possible exploitation attempts for involving the log4j vulnerability. The attack is not limited only to these ports. Log4j is obviously an open source Apache logging binary that is used in many Java applications. So awareness of normal baseline traffic of an environment for Java.exe while using this query will deter the normal from the abnormal. Next, again, is a fan favorite of mine, an external IP address in command line. So this query would look for command lines that contain a public IP address Attackers may use a hard-coded IP or C2 exfiltration. So this query can be filtered to exclude network prefixes that are known to be legitimate or illegitimate. We then have reverse shell connections. This next one honestly is my cleanest work. 
Oh, I forgot to say, any of these queries which I'm just uh, appearing on screen that are not an actual KQL query, these are all baked into Sentinel. So these are ones which I've just found in Sentinel and then mapped those to the cyber kill chain. So please, if you see a query on here that's not a full-blown query, that's just the name. So you can easily copy and paste that into Sentinel and it will come up for you. So the reverse shell connections, again, <laughs> this is my cleanest work. Um, but this is when an attacker is inside a machine and they initiate a connection to the user, which would be like a Windows 10 victim machine. And then that compute user's computer is actually listening for connections on a specific port. Then have de data exfiltration. So this is where the attackers get the data. They'll copy, transfer, move it, do whatever they want with it, but they'll do it in some sort of controlled location. What Where they do that is kind of unknown. But what they do with it, maybe they ransom it, sell it on eBay, send it to WikiLeaks. No one knows. You know, it's only them that are going to know what they're going to do with it. It could take days to get all of the data out of there, you know, out of an environment. But once it's out, it's in their control. So this is kind of a tough one to detect because an attacker is in. You don't know what their goal is. Is it to destroy something? Is it to hold them ransom? Are they just snooping around to bribe someone? Are they just being an idiot? You know, you don't really know. So I put kind of a list together uh, of a couple of detections, which should hopefully help you on your journey to improving the data exfiltration. So multiple users forwarded to the same, uh, user emails forwarded to the same destination. So this identifies when multiple, more than one users' mailboxes are configured to forward to the same destination. This could be an attacker a uh, controlled destination mailbox configured to mail from multiple compromised user accounts. We then have office mail forwarding. So adversaries often abuse email forwarding rules to monitor activities of a victim, steal information, and further gain intelligence on a victim or victim's organization. So this query over office activity data highlights cases where user mail is being forwarded and it shows if it's being forwarded to an external domain as well. You then have SharePoint file operations via client EP. So this kind of detects like for mass uploads and downloads, which returns the client IP. So if you're doing, uh, if you're finding an IP address that's downloading a hell of a lot of data or uploading a hell of a lot of data, then this is going to be very interesting for you to investigate. And the last one is a custom one, which I've built. Again, the, the, the three on screen right now are just baked into Sentinel. Uh, and and this, one's, this one's a banger. So this is detecting Azure backup data destruction. So adversaries will destroy or may destroy data, uh, virtual machines, files, backups within the network to disrupt availability to systems and their resources. So data destruction is likely to render stored data irrecoverable by forensic techniques. So having data backups provides a significant response and control to data destruction by enabling the restoration of a data backup. For the case in the cloud, like everyone that uses Azure Backup will probably use, uh, uh, sorry, everyone that uses Azure Virtual Machines will probably use Azure Backup as their technology. It's their predominantly the most chosen choice. Now, as I mentioned previously, you don't always know what the attacker's end goal is so this detection query will definitely come in handy for detecting data destruction from a backup perspective. I also have a video on this, a more in-depth one, which I'll put in the top right now. And that brings us to the end of the video. Thanks for watching the video. If you like the video, please give it a thumbs up. If you don't, well, that's just fine. Please subscribe, tell your friends, tell your family, tell your nan. Cheers.